I'm very uh, happy to be here to be able to tell you a little bit about my work on crime and place. And these three guys, I think, summarize it pretty well. Uh, location, location, location. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the importance of location or hotspots of crime in crime prevention. Now, right at the outset, I just want to uh, note that the work I'm going to tell you about occurs over two decades, and a lot of colleagues and students have participated in this work, and I won't have time throughout the presentation to name those them, so I've put them here to give them credit right at the outset. Okay, so the question is, how does this work differ from conventional ideas about criminology and crime prevention? Uh, criminology has had two basic uh, uh, foci over the years. One has been what might be called person-centered criminology. Uh, as this fellow says on the screen, apart from illiteracy, low self-esteem, homelessness, poverty, and a broken home, I can't find any reason for this delinquent's offending behavior. And the other fellow says it's a mystery. Well, that's been, that mystery has been the focus of much criminology for the last century. Indeed, that's been the predominant focus, and also the predominant focus of crime prevention has been programs that seek to do something uh, about offenders and to rehabilitate them or to deter them or change the way they behave in some way. Now, criminologists and people concerned with crime prevention have also put stress on community-based criminology. In this case, the interest is in large macro-geographic units, like neighborhoods or communities. Uh, in the slide, uh, we have a figure from Frederick Thrasher's work, a very famous uh, criminologist in the 1920s from the University of Chicago. He was very interested in gang problems, and he listed the area that's shaded here as the slum or gangland, the place that sort of produces the community or neighbor, a large area that produces crime problems. Now, the criminology of place that I'm going to tell you about today and its emphasis on hot spots of crime takes a very different approach and looks at the idea of microgeographic units of analysis. So on the left of your screen, you have an example from a study that Lauren Sherman and I conducted called the Minneapolis Hotspots Experiment. And I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, later. And in that study, we brought uh, a police patrol, intensive police patrol, to very specific hotspots of crime that were just a street block in length, often from intersection to intersection. On the right of the screen, you have an example of a slightly larger micro unit of analysis, but still a small hotspot. This is uh, from Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, from another study I'll tell you about later. The orange uh, in your screen is a, uh, is a hotspot of prostitution activity, in which prostitution sort of went around those blocks. Now, either of these types of hotspots are much smaller than the communities or neighborhoods that have focused uh, attention of, cr of crime prevention scholars and criminologists who've thought about doing something about crime problems. So my focus today is on this microgeographic unit, on these very small places. And what I'm going to argue is that these hot spots of crime should be a central focus for crime prevention. And let me tell you why. I'm going to show you that crime is very strongly concentrated at these hotspots. So we can focus on a very small group of places and deal with a fairly substantial proportion of the crime problem. I'm going to show you that the key geographic unit here is not the, hot, is not the community or the neighborhood, these macro geographic areas, but rather the hotspots. So it's not useful really many times to talk about bad communities that really stigmatizes the whole community. What I'm going to show you is the crime hotspots are often spread throughout the, the city, not only in so-called bad communities. And within those communities, most places are free of crime. And we're really talking about a relatively small number of locations. I'm also going to show you that crime is coupled to place, or tightly coupled to place. By that, I mean there's a glue sticking crime to place. And that's an advantage for us, because if there are specific reasons why crime is coupled to place, we can identify what those reasons are and try to do something about them. And it also means that the great boogeyman of this sort of approach, which is crime is just going to move around the corner, it's going to displace to areas nearby, may not be true, because the areas may, nearby may not have those same characteristics that are coupling those crime to those places. Now, because of that, uh, we have a number of studies that have been done on hotspots policing. 
And this is an area with a lot of empirical evidence. And I want to show you a little bit about uh, a little of that evidence. I'm going to show you that police cra can prevent crime and uh, crime hotspots. We have good experimental evidence for that, and they can do that without simply displacing crime. And finally, I want to talk about hotspots of crime as an opportunity for effective and efficient social prevention. And I won't have a lot of data to show you because this is a really new area of thinking, but I hope to encourage you in this area. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about community justice and hotspots of crime, or at least some ideas I have. And those ideas are coming from someone that knows really very little about the kind of work you do. So I hope after I give those ideas, you'll tell me how I was wrong and we ought to change it to make those ideas sort of work. Okay, so let me start out with the concentration of crime and hotspots. Now, since the late 1980s, we've had a series of studies that show us that crime is not spread throughout urban areas. They're concentrated in very specific places. Now, this, this is a slide from a study I did that was the first study to look longitudinally. What happens when we look over long periods of time? This is a 14 years in Seattle. We're looking at crime incidents. And we're looking at crime incidents at street segments from intersection to intersection. There are about 25,000 street segments in Seattle. Now, what you can see here is that 50 percent of the crime each year, it's an amazing stability, occurs at just 5 percent of the street segments. That that's really provides a tremendous opportunity. If, if crime is concentrated at a small number of places, why are we spreading crime resources all across the city? For example, as we commonly did with police in random preventive patrol, let's spread the police everywhere. They get a maximum deterrence. Well, you don't need maximum deterrence necessarily if crime is concentrated in a very small number of places. And by the way, these same concentrations have been found, although not longitudinally, in Minneapolis, in Boston, in other cities throughout the U.S., and I've even recently done a, st a, a study recently, and we found, looking at 2010, that 5% of the street segments in Tel Aviv produced 50% of the crime, which leads me to an idea which I call the law of crime concentrations. Now, if we look at even tighter concentrations, we, get, we can get a sense of even focusing our efforts even more. In Seattle, over the 14-year period we studied, 247 chronic crime street segments produced about 22% of all the crime incidents. So about 1% of the street segments produce about 23% of the crime. That's, an, again, an amazing opportunity for crime prevention. For certain specific types of crime, we found even greater concentrations. For example, in juvenile crime, we found that 86 street segments account for about a third of all official juvenile crime incidents. Of course, kids may be committing crimes in lots of other places that don't show up on the police records, but still to be able to approach a third of all the sort of police records on juvenile offending by going to 86 streets out of 25,000, well, that's an amazing opportunity for crime prevention. Now, what about a comparison? Well, we really don't have a good comparison because we don't know every person that commits every crime. But if we look at arrests, for example, we found in Seattle that about 6,000 offenders produced 50% of the arrests each year in Seattle. Now, about 1,500 street segments produced 50% of the arrests. So certainly we have a, a relatively smaller number of targets, though this is not a perfect comparison by any stretch. But it's a lot easier to find these street segments than it is to find these offenders. If you've ever gone, and I expect some of you have, gone in the street trying to find people uh, 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 that are repeat offenders or problematic offenders. Okay, so my first point was that crime is incredibly concentrated, and that provides an opportunity for crime prevention. But if those concentrations are all in one small area, this doesn't do us very much good. In other words, if it's really one bad community with all the 86 hotspots and it's in one part of that community, well, then we haven't really gone very much further than the Chicago School of Criminology did in the 1920s. But here's those 86 street segments. I think you can see them here. The first observation is they're spread throughout the city. Now, that's really interesting because the bad part of the city in Seattle is generally conceived to be down here. And the, up here and around these edges here, these are really nice areas, the whole north. So uh, in Seattle, what it turns out is that the hotspots for juvenile crime, not in one specific community, that's the bad community. I actually have to tell you that I find that idea of stigmatizing a whole neighborhood or a whole community as crime ridden is just wrong. Because I'll show you another slide in a, min a minute that talks about the tremendous variability within such communities. But anyway, so 
you have a tremendous spread of these hotspots. Now, there is a, a focus of the hotspots. It's not in the worst part of town. It's actually in the central business district. And the reason for that, as I'll tell you perhaps a bit about later, is that these are places with movies, malls, shopping centers, these are the juvenile activity spaces where these kids hang out. But even within that area of the center of the city, there's a good deal, if you look at this inset, and even here we could blow it up more, there's a good deal of street-by-street -street variability. Now, often when we think about crime in a bad area, this is the southern part of Seattle, it's a little more, it's not considered the best area of town. Uh, there are nice areas here as well, I should note. But if you look, the color here, the red on, on your screen, are the chronic crime hotspot, that 1% causing most of the problems. The green and yellow are places with no crime at all, with either no crime at all or very little crime. Now, first of all, on the right side there is an area people often think of as a problematic area. Most of the places have little or no crime. Most of the streets have little or no crime. And these are residential streets quite often as well. And those hotspots are spread again all over the place. So what we ought to be doing is sending our resources to those chronic crime hotspots that are producing a great deal of the crime problem and not spreading them, if you like, across whole areas. Okay, so I, I hope you'll accept my idea that crime is very concentrated at these micro places, that there is tremendous street-by-street -street variability, that they're often spread across an urban landscape, which means that they're not just proxies for communities. But another important fact of the research we've done is that crime is strongly coupled to place. What I mean by that, again, is that there's something binding crime to place. There are factors or characteristics of those places that draw crime there or that make crime a, a good activity for criminals in those uh, particular places. And that has two implications. If crime is coupled to place, then it means it just doesn't, you know, you can identify the problematic issues there. And if you can identify the problematic issues behind that coupling, then you can try to do something about it, right? The first element is diagnosis. What are the problems leading to crime there and what can we do about it? The second element is very important because as crime is coupled to place, then it doesn't just move easily to some other place. Because there are specific characteristics of those places that lead to crime. And other places nearby may not have those characteristics. Well, this is, a, uh, this is a statistical analysis, please excuse me, it's called a trajectory analysis. What we did was, we, uh, we took the 25,000 street segments over the 14 year period, and we tried to group them into statistical patterns or groups called trajectories. But what I want you to notice is this trajectory right here. This is the chronic crime street segments, I've already told you about that. 1% of the streets producing between 22 and 23% of all crime in Seattle over the period. But look how stable this is across the time period. There's a declining element here, not surprising in a way, this was during the great crime decline. Crime in Seattle declined about 22 or 23% during the period. But here this stability tells us that crime isn't just jumping from place to place. There's something there. There's something there holding that, creating that stability of crime. And what can those things be? This is from the juvenile study I told you about a few minutes ago. And over here with 6, 7, and 8, these are the locations of crime incidents for the hot spots, for those 86 street segments producing a substantial proportion of the juvenile crime problem. And what you can see here is, I've highlighted by blue, where are they? Shops, malls, restaurants, schools, youth centers. It's not surprising to you, but of course until you show something, I always say the best science is often obvious. Well, where are the kids committing crime? They're hanging out in places, right? In juvenile activity spots, where there's movies or other things to do. And then quite often, as sociologists would describe, they're not well supervised, and that's when they get themselves into trouble. So we could say that one of the things that leaks juvenile crime to place are these juvenile activity spaces. And the crime's not going to just move from the mall, by the way, to the street next door where there's private apartments, because the kids have nothing to do there, of course. Now we've tried to identify in our work the specific risk and protective factors that are related to crime at place. And we've done actually a pretty good job. Uh, this is work that's going to be coming out in the book at Oxford University Press called The Criminology of Place. And in that book, we tried to model to find those risk and protective factors that tell us something about why that coupling occurs. 
Now, those models explain about 70% of the variability in crime across street segments. That's another way of saying how well you're doing. Well, you're doing pretty well. Because Alex Picaro and I, we did a study in chronology of person-based explanations, how well they've done. And those have only gone, on average, about 32%. This is not an exact comparison, but it does tell you that very early on, we can identify a lot of the reasons why crime occurs in certain places, or at least the risk and protective factors for crime in those places. Now this is just a, a few of those characteristics. This is from a large multivariate analysis in which uh, uh, each of these individual traits are controlled for others. And if you look at the bottom, I've listed out all the traits that were uh, controlled in this analysis. And what we're doing here is predicting what makes you a chronic crime hotspot as opposed to a cool spot. Well, there are two sorts of groups of explanations you might think about that have different implications for crime control. So let me just tell you a bit about that. One is what we might call opportunity characteristics. In this area of work, the people that have been predominant theoretical, theoretically are people like Ron Clark, situational crime prevention, routine activities theory, uh, crime pattern theory. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these, but these are all theories that emphasize that at very specific locations, there are specific opportunities for crime. For example, if you have a victim at a place, potential victims, lots of people with money, and you have motivated offenders who are hanging out around there, and there's an absence of capable guardians, there are no police around, well, you're going to have a crime event. So they, this approach focuses on opportunities. There's another approach, it goes back to the 1920s at the Chicago School, mostly about communities. And this approach focuses on social interventions, on social disorganization. In other words, this approach says that, you know, the social nature of a place, whether it's poverty or social disorganization, whether the people can act together in a collaborative way, that will impact on whether crime can occur at that place. Because if people can exercise informal social controls, they can stop crime before it gets started. So those are the two predominant ways of thinking about these sorts of problems. In this area, almost all the thinking has been on opportunity. And in fact, opportunity is really important. This is an order of the strength of these variables as risk and protective factors. And it turns out the most important, the three most important risk and protective factors are uh, how many employees are on that block? Well, that's a measure of potential victims. People come to work, they drive their cars, they leave them on the street, they may leave on Fridays with checks, etc. More people around, they've become, if you like, potential victims. Well, the number of residents, well, that's just a, a way of saying that you have more people in the street, there are more potential victims. Again, an aspect of opportunity. It's also the case that high-risk juveniles are very strongly connected to whether you're going to be a crime hotspot or not. Uh, in this case, we define uh, high-risk juveniles as juveniles who have uh, problems with uh, um, truancy and bad records at school. And we think of them as potentially uh, uh, potential people who could be motivated offenders. There's one other thing to notice here. It's arterial roads. Uh, you saw that. I don't know if you noticed on the map I showed you before, all those red lines going down like this along arterial roads. Well, it's very important. Well, it's another opportunity characteristic. If people can get there, it means people are getting there, more people around, it's easier for offenders to get around. So opportunities are clearly important for chronic crime hotspots. And at least theoretically that suggests that if we can increase guardianship at those places, we can do something about crime. And indeed, I'm going to show you there's a very strong literature now on bringing police to hot spots of crime. So oppor uh, reducing opportunities through guardianship can be effective. But there are also social characteristics who show up, and this is really new and I think surprising to many people who work in this area. It turns out the property value is also an important predictor of whether you're in a, cr a chronic crime hotspot. It's not only that, increasing, crime, uh, increasing property values are also related to increases in the likelihood of crime over the period. So it turns out that the sort of a social feature, at least one element of socioeconomic status, has an impact on whether a place uh, produces crime. Even more interesting to me is the idea of collective efficacy. In recent years, in community research, there's been a strong emphasis that when people can work together for the common good, which is what collective efficacy is, that they can do something about preventing crime. They, it, it leads to an ability to exercise informal social controls. And there have been many programs that have 
developed with the idea of increasing collective efficacy in communities. Well, we found that collective efficacy, and the way we measured it was the percent of resident active voters. In other words, were people here, uh, uh, were they active, if they were active voters, we thought maybe they'd be active in other aspects of community affairs. But what we found was that collective efficacy is incredibly strongly predictive of crime at the street segment level. And by the way, there's tremendous variability street to street. One street, there's a lot of collective efficacy. Another street, there's very little. I think you guys probably all know that if you're working a bit in the community. In any event, that suggests that maybe we ought also to think about social interventions in doing something about crime in place. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we know about preventing crime in place from the perspective of the police. The first uh, major study in this area was conducted by Lawrence Sherman and I. I showed you the unit of analysis at the very beginning. It's called the Minneapolis Hotspots uh, Experiment. What we did is we identified 110 uh, hot spots of crime, uh, streets with a lot, a lot of crime, and then we randomly allocated them to a treatment group and a control group. And the treatment group received two to three times as much, crime, as much patrol as the control group. And this time, by the way, was during the nothing works period. So everyone was saying, you know, nothing works, the police can't do anything about crime. And if you look at, to the right of your slide, you can see, at least for most of the period we looked at, the experimental group had a lower crime rates consistently than the uh, control group. Now, you'll also notice that that didn't happen here. Uh, you notice this is the summer. In fact, it didn't happen here because the experiment broke down because the cops couldn't get more police patrol to the treatment sites. Everybody was going on vacation and the kids were out of school and things were getting a little crazy. But during the period they could, they were able to reduce crime. So it's not only theoretically true we should be able to reduce opportunity, it also works. The police could do something about crime. Now, the Minneapolis hotspot experiment led to a number of experimental and quasi-experimental studies of hotspots policing. And these have sh consistently showed the same results. Uh, Anthony Braga did a Campbell collaboration review in 2001. He found nine good studies to look at hotspots of crime. In seven of them, policing hotspots uh, had strong crime prevention benefits. He had five randomized experiments. Four of those five randomized experiments showed uh, significant effects for crime prevention. Now, a new Campbell review by Anthony Braga and colleagues finds 25 studies now, many of them experimental studies, and they find overall 20 of the 25 significant crime prevention benefits to hotspots policing, and uh, in a meta-analysis, significant uh, uh, effect sizes. Now, you could say, but doesn't crime just move around the corner? Well, having heard me a bit, you should say, well, no, no, that doesn't happen. Why? Because it may not be around the corner is as good a place to commit crime. It may not be a good place to commit crime at all. It may not have those characteristics coupling crime to place. But I wanted to do a study that focused specifically on that issue. And at the Police Foundation, we did something called the Police Foundation Displacement and Diffusion Study. In this case, we identified two uh, crime hotspots, one for prostitution, one for drugs and violent crime. We, ex we brought tremendous police resources to the hotspot area. You saw one of the hotspot areas at the beginning. We watched this very carefully. We did 3,020 minute social observations. We sent ethnographic researchers out to the sites, we did interviews with offenders. Well, you can see the results and all the figures pretty much follow this, that when, this is the treatment line, when we brought treatment, the behavior went way down at the prostitution site. So we knew that already, right? Hotspots policing reduces crime at the specific hotspots. But here are the areas around the hotspot, one street around, and this is two streets around. And what you find in catchment area one and catchment area two is not displacement. Displacement would be that these guys, this goes down, these guys go up, because crime's just moving around the corner. We find they follow basically the same pattern. And they follow what a colleague of mine, Ron Clark, and I call a diffusion of crime control benefits. Now, why is that? Well, it's because there weren't opportunities for crime nearby of the same type. For example, prostitutes don't like to operate in areas where there are a lot of people around who are going to call the police. And nearby this prostitution site, there were large apartment buildings, and they were concerned about that. It's also the case, by the way, that offenders resist spatial displacement. But that I mean that they become familiar quite often where they are. Do you like moving? They don't like moving. It's also beyond familiarity. It can be dangerous to move. There might be other people there who don't want you there if it's a good place for dealing drugs, for example. Or it may be that you don't know the people. You don't know who calls the police and who doesn't. You don't know who's problematic and who's not. And finally, it takes effort to move 
uh, where you commit crimes, just as it takes effort to move where you live or where you work. Now again, these findings have been confirm confirmed in systematic reviews. There are two Campbell reviews in this subject. Uh, Anthony Braga and colleagues, as I mentioned before, their new review looks at this. They find little evidence of displacement. They find significant evidence of diffusion of crime control benefits. And that's really important because that means that you can focus in on the hot spots and places nearby those hot spots get better as well. It's not just that you move things around the corner. Uh, Bowers et al. in another review looking not only at policing but of more general interventions finds that diffusion of crime control benefits is a more likely outcome of place-based initiatives than spatial crime displacement. Okay, the National Research Council, to sum up, says studies that focus police resources on crime hotspots provide the strongest collective evidence of police effectiveness that's now available. Hotspots and social prevention. Well, it's good I don't have a lot of evidence because I don't have much time left. So let me just tell you a little bit about that and ideas for you. So, I think there's a great opportunity here, a great opportunity to change the scale of social interventions for crime prevention. Because one of the criticisms that many crime prevention people I talk to is, I can't change poverty in neighborhoods, I can't change collective efficacy in neighborhoods. First of all, the way the government's going now, I don't have any money to do stuff like that. The money's getting smaller and smaller, it's just too big. And beyond that, it's just a scale beyond what crime prevention practitioners uh, can do something about. But what, a, what if the only thing we have to do is focus on 247 street segments in the city to get at a quarter of all crime problems? Well, then we've lowered the scale, and crime prevention practitioners can now focus their resources very efficiently. In this present government and Congress, this should resonate. They can focus very efficiently on a fall, small number of places. And they can think about doing something about those places and being successful. It's one thing to attempt change in social conditions of an entire neighborhood or city. It's another to try to ameliorate problems on specific blocks, on 1% of that city. And so my view is, perhaps it's time to consider providing, for example, economic aid to problematic street blocks and not to neighborhoods overall. And that's not crazy. In, in Redlands, California, a police chief uh, working with a housing authority brought housing money to neighborhoods, small areas, not full neighborhoods, where there was problems to try to improve housing. Weed and seed has done the same thing. Why not, instead of applying it to those large neighborhoods, go after these very, very specific places? You'll be able to use your money in effect, more efficiently. I think it's also maybe time to think of increasing collective efficacy on street segments and not in whole neighborhoods. Because it's just a hell of a lot easier to deal with smaller problems and ma that are manageable. So what about you guys? Community justice and hotspots of crime. And here, I, there's not only no evidence, I'm completely ignorant. So I say something embarrassing, be nice about it when you ask the questions, please. So here's the, let's say the following. Maybe we can marshal community courts to increase supervision. What do I mean? Are the police the only actors that can increase surveillance and deterrence of places? For sure not. Indeed, the police can be noxious. Let's take those juvenile hotspots. Sending police there is the worst thing you can do. There's plenty of evidence, there's a Campbell review that says, any type of police processing through the system is bad. So why would you send people whose major resource is arresting people, right? So sending police to juvenile crime hotspots may not be a good thing. So maybe we should be sending other people. I thought in Seattle, they're thinking of sending social workers and teachers to these malls and other places to hang out there and talk to the kids and do stuff like that. But maybe, and that's an aspect of increasing supervision, preventing that unsupervised socializing, maybe community sanctions can involve increasing adult supervision at juvenile crime hotspots. I think it's a nice opportunity. And what about marshalling community justice for increasing collective efficacy? You know, uh, maybe community courts can be used to increase collect collective efficacy at street segments. Maybe you can get uh, people to work at those segments with people, to increase their commitment, their willingness to involve themselves in public affairs. Maybe to increase their connection to the police, because one way to use the police effectively is to have the community connect to them, to get a sense of safety, so they can bring their own informal social controls, which in the long run are less costly and may also be more effective. Well, uh, I appreciate the time. I know it's the end of the day and everybody's tired and you've been through a lot, but I hope you'll agree with these guys that uh, location, 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 not only in real estate, it's also an important idea in crime prevention. Thank you very much.